Hi, I'm Patrick Egan with Educational Renaissance, and I'm here to talk with you about why I kissed lecturing goodbye. To begin, I want to talk about why lectures might be beneficial. I want to grant that there may be a case why we would listen to lectures, why a teacher would choose to teach in the lecture method. And to begin with, uh, first of all, it's a highly efficient method of teaching. You can teach large amounts of content. Second, you can teach to a large number of people. You can disseminate that information pretty rapidly because you can fill an entire hall with people and one person can stand up front and disseminate all of that content in one go. So that's one of the benefits of the lecture method. Another is that it's a highly efficient way to cover content. You can pace yourself to deliver quite a few different items of content to your audience in a fairly efficient way. There aren't interruptions. There don't have to be questions or interactions or discussions. Now, great lecturers will often invite that kind of community feedback or listener feedback but by and large, the lecture method is monodirectional, which means it becomes a very highly efficient way to deliver lots of content in a very stable way. The next reason why lecturing is a great benefit is because you can inspire an audience with the content. This often occurs when you have a great orator delivering that lecture in a lecture hall or a public forum in some way. I think particularly of a recent example, Jordan Peterson, for instance, is somebody that I constantly turn to as somebody who inspires me in his lectures. Oftentimes he is lecturing um, from material he's written, but also riffing off of that, coming up with new ideas, even in, uh, in the moment that he's lecturing. But most of us, uh, if we are honest with ourselves, aren't great orators when we are lecturing. We are often coming up with a PowerPoint and delivering our points as well as we can, hopefully honing our craft as communicators. But how many of us are truly great orators that in our lectures are inspiring our students in our lecturing? The other benefit of lecturing is that you can create stable content from year to year. The lecture I did last year, I can pull those same notes out and deliver pretty much the same lecture this year. And next year, I can turn to those very same notes, that very same bullet point, and deliver it again next year on schedule in the right sequence because the lecture can be highly stable. And then finally, a great benefit of lecturing is that you can disseminate new information. Like I mentioned with Jordan Peterson, he can come up with a new idea. He can read about it on the plane, absorb that into his model of interpretation, and deliver in lecture a rather new idea or a new way of interpreting certain ideas that might be available in recent politics or or in the news feed, but uh, lectures can be that way for a philosopher, a theologian, to come up with new ideas and have an avenue to deliver those ideas before he really commits them to print or before she really has uh, encapsulated the kernel of those ideas in journal articles or in a monograph of some kind. I th also think about the ways in which preaching is a very similar kind of thing. It is a monodirectional communication vehicle by which you can communicate to an entire church and through that inspire, convict an audience based on your reading of the word and you're disseminating new things that are highly relevant for that community on a weekly basis. But lectures have a tremendous downside. And so as we think about the downside of lectures, this is really why I kissed lecturing goodbye. 
And the first uh, detriment to this is students, by and large, aren't learning actually from the lecture. Students are generally learning from the notes they take from the lecture. So they're not in the learning environment learning. Yes, of course, they are absorbing as much as they can. But by and large, where the learning occurs is when they are outside of that space and reviewing the notes that they took and committing those to memory, rehearsing them themselves. I've had several students who've recorded lectures I've given and they play those back to listen to them over and over. And those are like notes in that they're not in the learning space learning this information, but they're going elsewhere, a coffee shop, their car, their living room, to do the actual learning of the content. Second, uh, students are passive in that learning environment. They aren't actively engaging with that material. What that means is, yes, there is this wash of knowledge and information that pours over them. They drink from the fire hose, but it's rarely the case that a student is acquiring new skills, using those skills, wrestling through the ideas that they're learning in a meaningful way when you are sitting and passively listening to a lecture. Another detriment to the lecture is that um, le lectures inhibit the exploration of new directions. Now, like I mentioned earlier, a good lecturer, a skilled teacher who is using lecturing may invite debate, dialogue, questions in the flow of that lecture. But all of a sudden it starts to break up that lecture and it makes it less monodirectional, maybe something altogether different than your typical lecture. If you aren't inviting that kind of thing, if it is 30 minutes, 40 minutes of monodirectional lecturing, working your way through a PowerPoint, you are rarely then allowing that material to take different directions, to let the ideas that you are presenting to now generate even more ideas. Of course, this can happen. Your learners might be picking up the pieces of ideas and now taking those in different directions. But we might also call that daydreaming where they are now exploring a new idea. You stimulated their thinking, and as you are continuing to charge through your material, they're actually on a tangent. That tangent may be a wonderful bastion of learning for that student, but where you are going is a very different direction because your lecture is charging forward while they've left the bus or the train. Another detriment of lecturing is that a uh, lecture rarely cultivates higher orders of thinking. Now, Jason has been uh, talking a lot about Bloom's taxonomy, and we could think about our higher order skills of thinking in a Bloomsian kind of way. We could also take the bait of what Jason is saying and think of it in Aristotelian ways. How are we cultivating intellectual virtues of courage, humility, if we are not giving students the opportunity to debate, discuss, wrestle through these things. If they're there to sit passively and listen, we're really only giving them the opportunity to acquire knowledge and not much opportunity to work through that. The final detriment to lecturing, I would say, is that lecture provides little feedback to the lecturer about the quality of the assimilation of knowledge. I can lecture for 30 or 40 minutes and feel really good about the slides I put in my PowerPoint, the way I presented myself. I might even have inspired my students and been great at my oratory, at my rhetorical craft. And yet, I might not know whether my strugglers were struggling in particular ways. At what point were my strugglers struggling? Now, it's definitely possible I could assign an essay or I could put a test before them to test their knowledge to find out whether they struggled on point two, whether they were really understanding the nuance of that third point I was making. 
but that may be weeks after I lecture. And then it feels a little too late to really get in there and review and comb over those points so that the student truly understands it at the point where they're ready to absorb it. So despite several of the benefits of the lecture method, I think there are a lot of downsides to it. And when I really contemplated what it was I wanted to be doing as an educator, even in the field of academic biblical studies, where lecturing is by and large the traditional model of teaching in colleges and seminaries, I found myself deeply disappointed with that as a method. And so I kissed lecturing goodbye. And I did this for five reasons. One, I felt that monodirectional communication was the least effective means for relational growth. I was truly inspired by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who spent a lot of time with the people he was mentoring. And I felt like if I'm going to be training people for ministry, I wanted to create a learning environment that was not monodirectional, but bidirectional or multidirectional, where there was a high level of relational activity in that learning environment. And if I was able to create that, that I would have students coming away from that feeling like they were cared for, but also like they, um, that they were carefully mentored in acquiring knowledge and skill. And because of that, I felt convicted that I had to get rid of lectures. Second, I felt like the great ideas were already there in the text. That meant that I could get out of the way. I didn't need to extract those ideas from texts, whether it's biblical texts, extra biblical texts, people like Boltmann or uh, N.T. Wright or some of the other great biblical studies authors. Marcus Bachmuel comes to mind as well. If I really wanted students to engage great ideas, all I would be doing as a lecturer is sifting those great ideas from texts, repackaging them in my own words, and delivering them in probably a more dry and stale way than the texts themselves would provide. So if I could utilize those texts in the learning environment, get myself out of the way, now I don't have to worry about my rhetorical style, my oratory skill, we could engage texts. That would be a much more productive use of our time as a class, and we could all gather around these texts and learn from them together, creating that highly relational environment I wanted in my classroom. The third reason why I kissed lecturing goodbye is that I saw there was this 80-20 principle. Who was putting in the most work in that learning environment? When people come into this classroom, if I'm the one putting in 80% of the effort and the effort on the part of the students might be 20%, they're taking notes, yes, but plenty of them might be playing solitaire on their laptops for all I know, thinking about other things, staring out the window, falling asleep. It just felt like it was wasted effort. Why put 80% of my effort into preparing a lecture and then delivering a lecture if it really wasn't going to have a tremendous amount of effect in the lives of the students who were coming to learn. Related to this, uh, it seemed to me the more engaged in the act of learning that a student was, the more they learned both of the content I might be trying to present as well as the skills that would help them achieve higher orders of thinking. Again, what I decided to do is instead of me being the text, me being the lecturer, I would bring in biblical texts and other texts that we could examine together. We could read them aloud, narrate them, discuss them in meaningful ways. And that became the model for me that I used in the classroom. I got these ideas, from Charlotte Mason. 
She's somebody we've talked about a lot on educational renaissance and somebody I, I really encourage you to think through as you consider your own pedagogy, as you hone your craft as a teacher. Uh, her model of teaching is really revolutionary. It transformed the way I think about teaching. It even transformed the way I think about parenting as well. And, uh, and it helped me to kiss lecturing goodbye. Finally, it seemed to me the end product for students is to engage in the great conversation. The Bible is not uh, flourishing in an academic environment. It is under attack in the academic environment. Well, where does the Bible in biblical studies truly flourish? Well, it's in an ecclesial setting. It's in churches. It occurs in uh, coffee houses and in community, uh, even outside of the church. It's part of the dialogue of our culture. And it seemed to me that the best way for students to be engaged in that great conversation was to be part of that great conversation in my classroom. Instead of listening to me lecture, why not engage them in the great conversation? What are the salient points of debate? And let's discuss those things. We might not come to a conclusion, but now we've actually understood all of the facets of what might be controversial in a text or what might be really inspiring and exciting about the text or the life of Jesus or the life of Paul. So engaging them in that great conversation seemed to be a greater end than what lecturing seemed to be intended to produce, which is another generation of academics who would turn around and now be the lecturers in a university setting who would promote lecturing biblical studies in the traditional mode of, of lecturing. It just seemed to reify that academic mode of biblical studies, which to me didn't seem to uh, be all that life-giving, at least not as life-giving as the way I see that great conversation unfolding in church settings, in personal conversations, in mom's groups, in men's Bible studies. So, I kissed lecturing goodbye. That doesn't mean I don't sometimes uh, commit to lecturing. There, there are plenty of times in my New Testament classes at seminaries that I will engage in an extended time of lecturing uh, simply because of its efficiency uh, of putting together a lot of pieces of the puzzle. But when I do lecture, it's very rare. And I'm usually trying to get through that so I can get to the good stuff of great discussions, reading great texts together so that we can build community around those great texts. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, I'm Patrick Egan with Educational Renaissance, and uh, we are promoting a rebirth of education by reaching into the past to look at uh, the great philosophers of education who've come before us, but also trying to synthesize that with uh, recent discoveries in education in modern times. I hope you enjoy these uh, discussions about uh, educational pedagogy and that it helps you with your craft of teaching.